subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello and welcome to rouse ias dns session we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 5th october 2021 we shall pick up articles important for civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of the exam this article is from page number 1 government moots changes to forest conservation act 1980 Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change has put out in public domain a draft for amendment to this act after the ministry has got the feedback it will prepare the draft again for clearance from the cabinet and the parliament before we start looking up what kind of amendment the ministry is trying to bring in the act let's see the provisions and the restrictions which are there in the act itself then we will understand if at all there is a need to bring in changes See Forest Conservation Act 1980 is the most important basic legislation in India concerning forest conservation concerning deforestation Previously the conservation of forests since the time of British were in the hands of states the provinces and that continued after independence but according to the data given out by ministry some 4.1 million hectares of forest land were diverted in 25 years from 1951-52 to 1975-76 and after 25 years waking up from the slumber the ministry's eyes were wide awake and decision were taken to centralize the conservation of forest affair the most important thing regarding forest conservation act 1980 is this it prohibits felling of forests meaning felling of trees for any non forest purpose without the prior clearance by the central government there are two things here first the definition of forest or the trees in the forest area and non forest purpose and forest purpose so felling of forest for non forest purpose requires consent of central government in 1988 another amendment was brought to this act which said that even though central government can give permission for diversion of forest for non forest purpose but still that permission can be given only to government agencies and not to private individuals or corporates bear these things for your prelims exam these are very important points now certain things have been defined in the act itself as forest purpose or non forest purpose as the name itself suggests any activity that helps in the conservation of forest is forest purpose for example establishment of check posts fire lines construction of fencing even the wireless communications that will be used for forest conservation bridges and dams water holes and trench marks these are considered as forest purpose or not considered as non forest purpose but however activities like plantation of tea coffee spices rubber palm oil bearing plants horticulture crops even medicinal plants all these kind of plantation activities they are considered as non forest purpose so for non forest purpose you cannot divert land without the consent of central government but this legislation also defines the forest area itself the forest area or the forest land has been mentioned in the act and it has mentioned four types of them reserved forest protected forest village forest and private forest Remember this fact four kind of forests have been mentioned in Forest Conservation Act 1980 reserved forest protected forest and other registered forest they are declared by state governments this is important what is more important than this is even though they are declared by state government but they cannot be denotified by state government itself once declared it is freezed from the side of state government then central government permission will be required to denotify them it's extremely important thing recently you might have heard and read about karnataka high court judgment karnataka government has denotified certain state forest with a noble intent of course to divert it for non forest use for rehabilitation of tribals and other people but the thing is that you cannot denotify it is illegal for the karnataka state government to do it because they can notify it they cannot denotify it so the karnataka high court has struck the decision of karnataka state government the crucial difference between reserve forest and protected forest is basically this rights to all activities like hunting grazing these are not permitted in reserve forest 
unless by specific orders they are permitted. Reserve forest has the highest degree of protection among all classes of forest. Below that is protected forest. In protected forest, right to activities like hunting and grazing are given to communities living on the fringe areas of forest because those communities are dependent upon the forest resource for their livelihood. The first reserve forest of India was Satpura National Park. First, this was declared as reserve forest and later its protection level was elevated finally to the national park. State government can also assign to any village community the rights of government over any forest that has already been constituted as reserved forest and that forest will be called as village forest. So village local administration will actually govern those reserved forests and those reserved forests will be called as village forest. Private forest by definition you understand would be on private lands. Now listen, when Forest Conservation Act 1980 was legislated, it was understood that, that the law will be applicable to registered forest. Forests owned and governed by the government. But in the Godavarman case of 1996, Supreme Court expanded the scope of Forest Conservation Act 1980. Supreme Court took the dictionary meaning of forest. So any forest, every forest will be covered under the Forest Conservation Act 1980 and not only those which are owned and governed by the government. And hence with that change, Forest Conservation Act 1980 will be applicable to all forests of nation and not only to the registered forests. Defining trees are fundamental to defining forest and the definition of tree that Forest Conservation Act 1980 has taken is the same as that given in Indian Forest Act 1927. The definition of tree in this act originally included palms, bamboos, stumps, brushwood and canes. But two years back, the definition was amended to remove bamboo from the definition of trees so that the interstate movement of bamboos will not require permits and it will be hassle-free. Bamboo has been declared by the finance minister in the budget speech as green gold. And to encourage national bamboo mission, this step was taken. The implication of removing bamboo from the definition of tree from the law would be that it won't require permit for interstate movement and felling of bamboo in non-forest areas will be permitted. Remember, even now, bamboos cannot be cut and transported from the forest area because the Forest Conservation Act 1980 says that forest cannot be felled for non-forest use without the consent of central government. So with change in the definition of tree, bamboos can now be felled in non-forest area but still not in the forest area. You must also be aware that as per the provision of Forest Conservation Act 1980, even the cultivation of fruit bearing trees or oil yielding plants or medicinal plants, even they are not allowed to be freely grown in the forest area because forest is an ecosystem and balance of ecology has to be ensured in the forest area. So even their approval is needed as per the law. The law was yet again amended in 1992. Earlier we have seen that felling the forest requires consent from the central government. But there are certain activities that does not require cutting the forest. So after the amendment, certain activities like setting the transmission line, the seismic survey, exploration and hydroelectric projects that does not require cutting of tree were allowed but with central government approval. But however, in wildlife sanctuaries and national parks, no exploration or survey can be done without prior approval of central government even if there is no cutting of tree involved. Even rearing of silkworms on trees are non-forest activities and they are not at all allowed in reserved forest. Non-forest activity means that it requires central government permission. But that permission will not be given in reserved forest. Now let's come to the proposed amendment to the law. See, this is at very early stage. It's the first draft that has been put in public domain. After the feedback, maybe the ministry will do certain changes. It will be cleared by the cabinet. It will come to the parliament. Maybe in the parliament, it will be sent to the standing committee. And standing committee may give some suggestions and maybe that will be incorporated. Then it will be passed in one of the house. Go to the other house. And maybe the other house will give some suggestion. And maybe that will be accepted as well. So. You don't have to ingrain them in your mind once the amendment is finally done. Then you have to know what are the final changes. But you have to be just generally aware as to what kind of amendment is being seeked. 
First of all, the government is trying to give some exemptions to certain kind of projects. Projects which are important for national security, projects which are important for border infrastructure and certain strategic projects. Like building important infrastructure, oil exploration, they will not require clearance from the center. So perhaps the category of projects will be created by the central government and if a project lies to particular categories, that won't require clearance from the government. The draft amendment also says that underground exploration and production of oil and natural gas through extended reach drilling will not require consent if the origin of drilling was outside forest land. But in due course that underground drilling has reached to the forest land, then also it won't require the clearance. The draft also says that land that has been acquired before the date of passing of this law by public sector bodies, they do not require further clearance by the central government under the law. Because presently, the public sector bodies like Indian Railway, NHAI, PWD, they are required to take approval under the Act. And it's not just the approval, they also have to pay compensatory levies like net present value or some amount under compensatory afforestation. So payment of these levies and also the consent from the government will be exempted. For your exam, it's important for you to know what is net present value and how it is calculated by whom. For diversion of land, this concept has been developed. And this is a one-time payment that the user has to make for diverting forest land for non-forest use. The concept has been developed within the scope of Forest Conservation Act 1980. And it is calculated based upon the services and the ecological value that that particular area of forest must be giving that you want to divert. The monetary value of these services and ecological value are calculated that sum of money is submitted to compensatory afforestation fund which is managed by COMPA, Compensatory Afforestation Management and Planning Authority. But one shall pay this amount of net present value only after clearance has been given by the ministry. The clearance is suggested and the amount is calculated by Forest Advisory Committee. Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change forms this committee under the provision of Forest Conservation Act. So Forest Advisory Committee is actually a statutory body. Regarding net present value, you must also know that social infrastructures like schools, hospitals, village tanks, fiber optics, these projects are exempted from paying net present value. And underground mining and wind energy, projects like these, they are exempted by 50%. Previously, we saw that Supreme Court increased the scope of Forest Conservation Act 1980 in Goda Verman case. In the same very case, it was Supreme Court that mandated the payment of net present value. And later, Kanchan Gupta Committee was developed to look into the concept of net present value. So after the proposed amendment, compensatory levies like net present value will not have to be made by public sector bodies who have acquired land before 1980 and they will be using the land for the same stated purpose for which the land was acquired. There's another very significant proposed amendment. The amendment proposed to empower the state government to lease forest land to private individuals and corporations. Previously, we have seen that after 1988 amendment, the diversion of forest land for non-forest purpose was not allowed. It was allowed A, after the consent of central government and B, but now the changes is shifting the power in the hands of the state government. Initially, in the beginning of the discussion, we saw that this law itself came because of recalcitrance of a state government whether perceived or real. But giving power back in the hands of a state government has brought us back to the future. Then there are changes in the definition of non-forestry activities. There are certain activities that the amendment is proposing to bring out of the definition of non-forestry activities like zoos, safaris, forest training infrastructures, surveys and explorations. And very important, remember, plantation of native species of palm and oil bearing trees. These presently are in the definition of non-forest activities, but the amendment seeks to bring it out of it. So if they are not non-forest activities, then they would be permitted. You must be aware of protests going on for tiger safaris in Madhya Pradesh and opening of a zoo in the Arir forest of Mumbai. Those activities will be eased if these amendments are brought. 
you can develop your own point of view whether these amendments are justified or not but we are not having a stand on it right now because we don't even know if these proposed amendments will be pushed through if you remember two years back some amendments were proposed to indian forest act 1927 but after a stiff resistance it was taken back so there is not much point in having a hard stand on these amendments we can only have them once the parliament clears it there is an article on page number eight hold sri lanka provincial polls we are going to discuss this in greater detail than what has been provided in the article to have a satisfying understanding of the issue initially we'll understand the history of tamil sinhalese conflict which is continuing even today then we will see the demand of separate tamil state in sri lanka that emerged because of discrimination against tamil speaking population then we'll see the intervention on peace process in sri lanka resulting in india sri lanka peace accord and 13th constitutional amendment in sri lanka's constitution we will understand why this 13th constitutional amendment has not been implemented yet and the root cause of that is the present semi-presidential form of governance in sri lanka finally we'll see what ramification this is going to have on india sri lanka relation and india's geopolitical strategy in the neighborhood i'll quickly give you a brief history as to from where this tamil sinhalese hostility began sri lanka was colony of britain britain came in 1815 and went back in 1948 back then sri lanka was called as ceylon when britishers came in 1815 sri lanka predominantly had buddhist sinhalese population which numbered around 3 million and the tamils numbered around 3 lakh so 90 percent of the population was buddhist sinhalese 10 percent was tamils but there was no hostility because in that proportion of population there cannot be hostility to the extent of ethnic strife civil war bloodbath that happens when there are two dominant ethnic groups so there was no question of that before the britishers came the ancestors of the present sinhalese population most likely came from the southern india back in 500 bc and there is documentation of the contact between the sinhalese population of sri lanka with the tamil speakers from south india from 2nd century bc when britishers came they started cash crop plantation on the island first they started with coffee then they went on with plantation of rubber and tea and for the purpose of plantation they brought around a million tamil speakers from india this was a general practice of Britishers. They have done it in their other colonies as well. For example, in Malaysia, they brought the Chinese, they brought the Indians, and there was Malay population from the beginning. But there is no ethnic strife in Malaysia presently. In Sri Lanka, the Britishers designed to develop ethnic strife. They deliberately segregated the Tamil-speaking population in the northern region of the country. And most importantly, they preferentially appointed Tamils to bureaucratic positions and sidelining the Sinhalese majority. This was the classic divide and rule tactics that the European powers have deployed in all their colonies. And because of this divide and rule strategy of Britishers, we see ethnic strife not only in Sri Lanka, but to worst extent presently in Rwanda and Sudan. It all has been sown by the Britishers. So obviously, if you will sideline the majority of the nation from bureaucracy, from government position, then there will be discontentment among them. But then there is a question of leadership also. When the South Africans got independence, they had a similar problem. The whites were subjugating the blacks for long and now the blacks were in power. But under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, the blacks didn't start to subjugate the whites once they were in power. And today South Africa is the only nation in Africa which is flourishing. South Africa is the only nation where there is no problem of racism. But when they got independence in 1948, Instead of taking the minority together, the Sinhalese leadership started to discriminate upon Tamils. They passed the Ceylon Citizenship Act 1948 that made very difficult for Tamils to get the citizenship of the nation. Around 7 lakh Tamil-speaking people were rendered stateless, 3 lakh migrated to India. They also made Sinhalese as the official language of Sri Lanka, sidelining Tamil and Tamil-speaking people. They forced the Tamil-speaking officials who were not well-versed in Sinhalese to resign from bureaucracy. And only after the bloodbath that started in 1980s, in 2003, all the Tamils of Indian origin were granted citizenship. But by this time, 
only 5% of Tamils were left on the island. Because of the discrimination faced by Tamil-speaking population of Sri Lanka, they started the planning and contemplation of separate Tamil state, terming it as Tamil Elam. Elam was the name in the Tamil language for Sri Lanka. This demand and this sort of movement of Tamil Elam was supported by one of the employees of British High Commission in Colombo and he became the chief theoretician for LTTE, Liberation Tigers for Tamil Elam. And finally, in 1976, LTTE was founded by Velupillai Prabhakaran. LTTE in early 1980s launched a full-scale nationalistic insurgency in northern and eastern part of the country because in northern and eastern part, the Tamil-speaking population were dominant and still today, the majority of Tamil population is in the northern and eastern portion of Sri Lanka. There is a long, long history of ethnic strife, the bloodbath, conflict, killing, butchering of people, everyone fighting everyone. Tamils killing Sinhalis, Sinhalis killing Tamils, Tamils killing Muslims, Muslim killing Tamils. There has been incident when military has gone to schools and killed all the students. Many, many mass graves have been found in the country. The history of civil war is depressing, it is devastating. We will not get into it primarily because that is not part of our syllabus. But what we are interested right now is the 13th Constitutional Amendment of Sri Lanka. So we'll come to 1987 when the first Elam War ended. LTTE declared the first Elam War in 1983. Then there was second Elam War and third Elam War. And then there was retraction and re-emergence of insurgency. Then there was bloodbath. Then there was more bloodbath. And finally, LTTE was washed out in 2009. But we'll look at the incidents in which India had stake. And the most important of that is Indo-Lanka Accord of July 1987. Look, India was getting wary of the civil war going on in Sri Lanka because it was happening in neighborhood. And because of the civil war, there was a threat of influx of huge refugees into our nation. Additionally, there was issue of Tamil speaking population that had roots in India. So there was risk of insurgency in India as well. Also being a responsible power hailing human rights, we had to do something about violation of human rights happening in our neighborhood. So Rajiv Gandhi government decided for a direct intervention by sending military to Sri Lanka. And because of the pressure from India, Sri Lanka got into this Indo-Sri Lanka Accord. And the most important outcome of Indo-Sri Lanka Accord was 13th Constitutional Amendment. This amendment mandated a measure of power devolution to the provincial councils which were established to govern the island's nine provinces. See, Sri Lanka has unitary form of government where the center is very powerful and overrides all the provincial government. In unitary form of government, there is no devolution of power. With this amendment, the ray of hope was that the unitary nature will change to a federal nature or a quasi-federal nature at least. The provincial councils that were formed were assured of power devolution to self-govern. Subjects like education, health, agriculture, housing, land and police were devolved to provincial administration. But because of the history of semi-presidential form of government, this was not an easy task. There were restrictions on the financial power of the province and precedent had overriding powers by constitutional amendment of Sri Lanka. So any decision of the province can be overturned by the president. So far, no province have been devolved with the power of police and land. Apart from creation of provincial councils and the promise to devolve power to them, the 13th constitutional amendment also recognized Tamil as second official language of Sri Lanka. But there was a problem. It was opposed by both the Sinhalese nationalist parties and LTTE. The Sinhalese nationalist party thought too much of power is being shared by provinces and in turn with the Tamils. The LTT deemed it too little because they were fighting for a separate state and now they'll have to settle with only provincial power and that too in a limited manner because president has an overriding power over the provinces. There was a third problem. It was widely perceived as an imposition by India symbolizing the hegemonic influence of India, the dominance of India over Sri Lanka. Many political analysts say that had it not come under Indo-Lanka Accord, had it come from within the Sri Lankan government, then the picture might have been different today. But the ground reality is that the 13th Constitutional Amendment of Sri Lanka represent the only hope for the settlement of long-pending Tamil question in Sri Lanka. 
Even recently, during the bilateral talk with the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Mahindra Rajapaksha, Prime Minister Modi has raised this issue of implementation of 13th Constitutional Amendment. The issue of 13th Constitutional Amendment has come to the fore again because there has been demand from the cabinet ministers of the Mahindra Rajapaksha government to abolish the provincial councils that were formed by the 13th Constitutional Amendment. The argument is that they are white elephants, meaning too expensive and useless. They argue that in a small country, the provinces could be effectively controlled by the centre and there is no need of different layers in the governance structure. The counter-argument could be that devolution of power is not only for administrative purpose, but it can also become a tool for representation of various ethnicity in the governance and social harmony. That was the purpose with which 13th constitutional amendment came. So many political analysts are pointing it out that it is not the question of governance structure in Sri Lanka. It is the question of sharing any political power with the Tamil minority. Because in the 53 member strong cabinet of Mahindra Rajapaksha, there are only two Tamilians. And to understand it a little more as to why the present leadership is nervous about sharing power with the Tamilians, we'll have to go back again in the timeline of 1987. From 1987, things started to become worse in Sri Lanka. Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi decided to intervene directly in the Sri Lankan civil war and he sent a peacekeeping force with around 1 lakh troops to Sri Lanka. But things did not quite work out well for India. LTTE started fighting Indian troops. India was forced to pull back and 12,000 Indian soldiers died in battling the insurgents in Sri Lanka. In 1991, one of the LTTE suicide bombers killed Rajiv Gandhi and later the president Rana Singhe Prem Dasa, who signed the Indo-Lanka Accord, was also killed in 1993. In 2002-2003, some kind of understanding developed between the Sri Lankan government and LTTE and various ceasefires were negotiated. This was mediated by Norway. At this point, LTTE agreed for a federal solution rather than a separate Tamil state. And the government also ceded to give up the unitary form of governance in Sri Lanka and come to a federal structure. But this peace did not last long. Later in 2003 itself, LTTE declared themselves in full control of the north and east region of the country. And this prompted retaliation from the government. Then came tsunami of 2004. And after tsunami, there was brutal clash between government and LTTE over the question of distributing aid in the LTTE controlled areas. Then Mahindra Rajapaksha government in 2009 decided to go all out after LTTE and there was brutal counter insurgency measure taken up by the Mahindra Rajapaksha government. It is estimated by UNHRC that around 40,000 civilians died in the counter-insurgency measure. Anyhow, in 2009, LTTE was brought down and the remaining leaders and the fighters surrendered. The point I'm trying to make here is, Mahendra Rajapaksha is the leader who is seen as the man who brought down LTTE. Thousands and thousands civilians died in the process. That caused collateral damage. Somebody's uncle, somebody's son, somebody's brother has died in the process. The wound is still fresh and Mahendra Rajapaksha has come back to power after 2015 on a national sentiment and there is no effort on the part of present Sri Lankan leadership for any rapprochement with Tamilians. Rather, they are pulling back on the rapprochement measures that was taken by the previous dispensation. For example, singing of the national anthem in the Tamil language for their national day celebration. There is one more thing that I will discuss in this regard. As we have mentioned before, that 13th constitutional amendment of Sri Lanka is seen as the only hope to solve the question of Tamil problem in Sri Lanka. The reason is it has the provision of devolution of power to the provinces. See, the Tamil population presently is around 11% in Sri Lanka. So there is no way a government can be formed representing the aspiration of Tamilians. But however, in the northern and eastern provinces where they are dominant, there they can gain substantial power. So devolution of power is one way of bridging the gap and also empowering Tamil people. But that is not an easy task as long as Sri Lanka has unitary nature in its form of governance.
So let me very quickly tell you about the present governance structure of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has semi-presidential form of government. In any semi-presidential form of government, like the one that exists in France and Russia too, there is a president and there is a prime minister. The president is the real executive authority. Unlike the parliamentary form of government like in India, president is a nominal executive authority. But the role of head of government may also be exercised by the prime minister, unlike the presidential form of government. Let me very quickly give you a brief understanding of the three common form of governance. Presidential, semi-presidential and parliamentary form of government. In presidential form of government, we have only president as the head of the state and the head of the government. In parliamentary form of government, we have both a president and the prime minister. President is the head of the state and the prime minister is the real executive authority, the head of the government. In semi-presidential government, there exists both a president and a prime minister. And government is led by both the president and the prime minister. In parliamentary form of government, head of the state, the president, is not popularly elected. In India, he is indirectly elected. In parliamentary democracy like Britain, the head of the state is a monarch. It is hereditary. In presidential form of government, head of the state is elected, which is president. In semi-presidential form of government, the head of the state is popularly elected, just like presidential form of government. And then the president chooses for himself the prime minister from the majority party in the parliament. One of the chief distinction between presidential form of government and parliamentary form of government is the legislative responsibility. The head of the government and the cabinet is responsible to the legislature. Legislative responsibility means legislature can vote the government out. In presidential form of government, there is no legislative responsibility. Legislature cannot remove the president who has a fixed term unless there is a gross misbehavior and in that case the president can be impeached but otherwise the president cannot be removed. In semi-presidential form of government however there is legislative responsibility. The president who is leading the government, he is head of the government is responsible to the legislature and there is a process of impeachment of the president just like we have. Although in case of Sri Lanka there is a rule of supreme court as well. The impeachment process in Sri Lanka has to be accepted to the Supreme Court, which is not the case in India. This legislative responsibility comes from the fact that government depends on legislative majority. If there is no majority in the parliament, then the government will fall. And similar structure exists in semi-presidential government as well, because the prime minister comes from the parliament. The president chooses his prime minister from the party which has majority in the parliament. So if there is no legislative majority, then the government will fall. But in presidential form of government, there is no such dependence on legislative majority. There is absolute separation of legislature, executive and judiciary. In parliamentary form of government, executive is part of legislature. The prime minister, all the ministers, they are part of Lok Sabha or Raj Sabha. In semi-presidential form of government, president is not part of legislature, but his prime minister is part of legislature. So the government is partly part of legislature. Semi-presidential form of government is basically to bring stability in governance. Where there is coalition government and government is too often falling, their presidential form of government is brought about. For example, in France, France had the problem of coalition government and government was voted out too early. So to bring stability, they had semi-presidential government where prime minister will go, the government will go, but the president won't go. The president will have a fixed term. So that will provide a kind of continuity in the governance and still there will be legislative responsibility. So Sri Lanka has semi-presidential form of government, but after 1978, the constitutional amendment gave president too vast power. The president can now summon, suspend or end a legislative session or even dissolve the parliament at any time after the parliament has served a term of one year. The president will choose his prime minister from the party having majority in the parliament, but this is a general feature of semi-presidential form of governance which is prevailing in other countries like Russia and France as well. President has the power to remove the prime minister or even the ministers and it is very difficult to remove the president because all the provisions that you know about removal of president in India, everything is there but additionally it has to be acceptable to the Supreme Court as well. And because of excessive power in the hands of the president, in reality, although despite 13th constitutional amendment, the form of governance in Sri Lanka is unitary. The previous dispensation, which was a unity government, 
they tried to change this and they have brought 19th constitutional amendment to curb the powers of the executive president and they have tried to strengthen the power of parliament and independent commissions and courts and etc but not much has been done regarding 13th constitutional amendment and this is one primary reason apart from the human right violation that often goes on that the economic intelligence unit in its democracy index has rated Sri Lanka as a flawed democracy in 2019. Now let's come to the challenge that the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka throws to India in its geopolitical strategy. Because of the stiff competition that India faces with Sri Lanka in terms of trade, in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of strategic advantage, India have to walk a very tight rope. You may also remember that in 2014, India abstained from voting against Sri Lanka in UNHRC resolution in Geneva. The resolution was calling for a probe into alleged war crimes by Sri Lanka, but India abstained from voting. This was done not to sway Sri Lanka away from India towards China. Also, the Raja Pakshas, both the Prime Minister and the President, are known to be pro-China. It was Mahendra Raja Pakshas government that opened Sri Lanka to massive Chinese investment. They gave Hamban Tota port to Sri Lanka on lease for 99 years. Apart from that, they also have given 15,000 acre of land to Sri Lanka on lease. Hamban Tota port is a deep sea port and it can be used for strategic and military purpose. This deal was put on hold by the previous dispensation led by the Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, but the present leadership wants it to be restored. We have done all we could to keep Sri Lanka a good neighbor and a good friend. Recently, India has announced 50 million line of credit for security and counter-terrorism measures and another 400 million for infrastructure development in Sri Lanka. We are trying really hard to keep the Chinese hegemony away from the Indian Ocean. But the question is, how can we continue doing it? A. When the government in Sri Lanka presently is pro-China and B. It has a history of subjugating the rights of Tamil-speaking population in Sri Lanka. That is a diplomatic puzzle that we need to solve. There is an article on the business page, Need to double infrastructure spending, says the Secretary to Department of Economic Affairs. See, we will do one small thing concerning this article for prelims examination. Infrastructure spending is mostly capital expenditure. We shall look at the trends that was put forward in the union budget concerning revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. Although it does not show in this graph, but the data put out by government is this. The share of revenue expenditure in the total expenditure has increased from 73% in 1990 to 84% in 2021. So revenue expenditure of the government is 84%. So naturally the capital expenditure must have decreased. And the number is, it decreased from 27% in 1990 to around 12% in 2019-20. This decrease in capital expenditure is not good news for any economy. Similarly, you must know that higher share of our fiscal deficit is used to fund revenue expenditure rather than capital expenditure. So the quality of our fiscal deficit is also deteriorating. Government is incurring higher revenue expenditure because of increased subsidies. The higher interest burden of loan for the government and increased expenditure in public administration. Now speed up for the speed test. Statement 1. The Forest Conservation Act 1980 prohibits the felling of forest for any non-forestry use without prior clearance by the central government. The statement is very factual and an important one concerning the act. Statement 2. The Environment Impact Assessment has legal basis in the Forest Conservation Act 1980, which is an incorrect statement because it has legal basis in Environment Protection Act 1986. Central government's approval is required before assigning forest lands on lease to any private person or corporation or organization. In 1988, the Forest Conservation Act was amended and transfer of forest land to private entities were barred. But later, multiple amendment to the act has allowed it, but it requires central government's approval. So the statement is true. You also know that this power is now being suggested to move in the hands of state government 
via the amendment to the act the draft of which has been put in public domain statement 4 the cultivation of tea coffee spices rubber palm oil bearing plants horticulture crops or medicinal plants are all non forest purpose for the purpose of forest conservation act the statement is again true and factual but you also must know in the draft amendment that has been put out by the ministry traditional plantation and traditional oil bearing plants will be put out of the definition of non forest purpose statement 5 reserved forest and protected forests are declared and denotified by the respective state governments well they are declared no doubt by the respective state governments but they cannot be denotified by the respective state governments that makes the statement incorrect statement 6 is rights to all activities like hunting grazing etc in reserved forests are completely banned and in protected areas right to activities like hunting and grazing are sometimes given to communities living on the fringe of the forest because of this phrase completely banned the statement becomes incorrect because via notification government can allow it forest conservation act is applicable only to forests recorded by government again this word only makes the statement extreme and when this happens we have to be very cautious why the supreme court judgment of 1996 the dictionary meaning of forest has been taken for the purpose of forest conservation act and not only those recorded by the government the statement is incorrect rearing of silk worms is allowed in reserve forest and does not require government permission reserve forest has highest level of protection and rearing silk worms are not allowed here the statement is incorrect The concept of net present value was introduced by Gadgil Committee. This is factually incorrect. It was done by Kanchan Gupta Committee that that was appointed subsequent to the Supreme Court judgment. Under the Forest Act of 1927, the definition of tree includes palms, bamboos, stumps, brushwood, and canes. Until two years back, the statement used to be correct, but at this point in time, this is incorrect because bamboos. have been taken out of the definition of tree and by the way do you know bamboo is actually a grass capital expenditure has consistently reduced in last two decades well for two decades nothing remains consistent as you can see here it decreased and increased and decreased and increased and increased and decreased and increased and decreased and increased nothing happens so consistently the statement of course is incorrect us backed race to zero is targeted at sdg goal 2 there's an article on page number 7 today where you'll find reference to race to zero but race to zero is not so much linked with sdg 2 which is about reducing hunger race to zero is about increasing employment and tackling climate change in a sustainable manner so the statement again is incorrect 13th constitutional amendment in sri lanka was an outcome of indo lanka accord of 1987 you must must have picked this and this is an important thing the statement is factual and correct 1987 bilateral accord between india and sri lanka was monitored by un well using common sense a bilateral accord is not likely to be monitored by un it was a bilateral accord statement is incorrect 20th constitutional amendment in sri lanka seeks to remove the provision of provincial councils created by 13th constitutional amendment but the fact is that provincial councils were created by 19th constitutional amendment making the statement incorrect now come forward and tell me in the comment section how much did you score here now you have question for the day for today and answer to yesterday's question of the day try to attempt the question post your answer in the comment section and also try to attempt the dns quiz on the elearn platform goodbye take care